This program is brought to you by Penguin Books, the publishers of Too Big to Fail, a brilliantly reported true life thriller that goes behind the scenes of the financial crisis on Wall Street and in Washington. Andrew Ross Sorkin's New York Times bestseller gives a definitive blow by blow account of the economic crisis that brought the world to the brink. Through unprecedented access to the players involved, he recreates all the drama and turmoil of those turbulent days, revealing never before disclosed details and recounting how, motivated as often by ego and greed as by fear and self preservation, the most powerful men and women in finance and politics decided the fate of the world's economy. Too Big to Fail, available now from Penguin Paperback. Welcome back to Penguin Classics On Air. Kubrick read Cobb's novel at the age of 14 and directed the 1957 film adaptation starring Kirk Douglas, which you have described as the most important political film of the 20th century. How does Kubrick change or enhance Cobb's original? I think he's in the spirit of Cobb's original throughout. Uh, there are things that he is not focused on that, that Cobb spent a great deal of time writing about. The, the quotidian horror of the men in the trenches uh, is assumed. Uh, it's assumed in that wonderful tracking shot at the beginning of the film uh, where, the, where the camera maneuvers through the trench as the men look at the general before the attack. It's assumed, but you don't really live with the men in that. You know, you're not going to see the rats. You're not going to see the bodies. You don't ever see Germans. I mean, the attack is so impersonal in the film. It's, it's the same way in the book. But Kubrick was not particularly interested in the mechanism of war as it, you know, he was, he was anxious to get to the other story, which is the, the political dynamic after the failed attack. And there he added one element that, that I, I think is really a result of him working post-war, post-World War II in, in a Cold War setting, in a, in a setting of that sort of spy versus spy, Berlin is this, Prague is that, the, the world has been upended, right is wrong, wrong. You had to be in the Cold War dynamic to come to the mo- notion of the, of, the German, of, I'm sorry, of the French generals betraying each other. That was the added element, uh, I think, that, that, that raises the movie's game when it comes to the political and makes it, makes it a very sophisticated political tract. That was probably the most unique thing that, that Kubrick did. The other thing is uh, that that remarkably humanistic scene at the end of the film with the French soldiers uh, who have been so betrayed and, and treated with such contempt by their by their institution, uh, and they are in turn treating a captured German girl with, with a certain amount of contempt and may forcing her to sing for them, and and then her, at the sound of her voice they crumble and they become human beings. That's Kubrick's creation, clearly. It's not in the book. And yet, I, I, it, it's not a moment of gross sentimentalism. It, it, it's in keeping with the humanity that is always right there under the surface of, of Cobb's account. I think Cobb would have recognized the moment and understood the need for it. Several universities across the country have been teaching The Wire in ethics, communication, and criminal justice courses. Professor William Julius Wilson teaches a Harvard seminar and explained that the series, quote, has done more to enhance our understanding of the challenges of urban life and the problems of urban equality than any other media event or scholarly publication, including studies by social scientists, unquote. What could students who study The Wire through these various disciplines learn from reading Cobb's Paths of Glory? Well, I think they could look upon the institutional imperative is being something that needs to be acknowledged in in all of our political and social and economic framework. Um, any institution that we create uh, as a society, uh, from in this instance from a military to a school system to a um, police department to a Department of Homeland Security to a Department of Agriculture, whatever we create to service, to serve and be served uh, as part of the society, has the capacity to betray its own purpose and to betray betray the people who work for it and who the institution is supposed to work on behalf of. That is almost a certitude of modern life. There's a distance between human beings now that is as life has become complicated and modern and bureaucracies have become self-sustaining, 
that's the threat. It doesn't mean that we, we're not supposed to have a Department of Agriculture or a school system or a police department. We need institutions in order for society to function. But they have to be constantly challenged. And human beings need to assert on behalf of human dignity. And that needs to be a constant process. Freedom, uh, it's famously said, can never be wholly won, but it can be lost. And so this is a constant fight that needs to happen. And I, I frankly am terrified going forward uh, for, for the American experiment because I think the institutions now, the, the, the game has been stacked against the individual in order to assert for dignity in the context of, these, uh, uh, of the institutional imperative. I think we are at a point where the institutions are so self-protecting and so moneyed uh, and, and our political structure, which is supposed to be the agent of reform, has been so moneyed by corrupt political contributions and you know, the, the emphasis of capitalism to, 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 to not only control the economic imperative but to control the political, that it's becoming harder and harder to assert for dignity. It's harder and harder to get these institutions to admit fault. And you see this everything from the, in everything from the BP oil spill currently to uh, the behavior of our military in you know, Abu Ghraib and places like that. Holding people accountable and holding institutions accountable um, is becoming harder and harder. And, and our press, our free press, which has really been the, the bulwark of doing that, has been... Uh, I think, emasculated uh, at this point by uh, the same economic imperatives that are arguing for a totalitarian support of, of capital and property over, over, hu- over human beings. I mean, I think that's, that's been the last 30 years in this country. We have mistaken capital and the, and the aggrandizement of property um, for not f- merely for an economic engine, which it is, a valuable economic engine, we've mistaken it for a social compact, for a way to build a just society. So, you know, Cobb lived that. Cobb was in the trenches. He was subject to a totalitarian impulse that said, we're going to attack, you know, and we're going to win, and if we don't win, we're going to blame the men, and we will not be responsible. And he saw that, and and, and he saw that from the trench looking up. He saw how how meager the concern was for the idea of, of, of human dignity. And he saw it at the beginning of the, of, the, of the 20th century. We're now in the 21st century, and the warning that he gives in this book is still as elemental and as necessary as it was when he wrote it. And in your opinion, what makes Paths of Glory relevant, modern? What makes it a classic? I think anybody fighting a war, a postmodern war, in the 21st century, particularly a war of attrition, which the war on terror really has become, if you think about it. Or the drug war, for example, a war of attrition where it's, there's no real logic as to when we're going to win or why we're going to win or what winning is. It's merely a matter of the body count on either side for the terrorist, for the drug dealer, for the cop, for, for the... Uh, the anti-terror, terror. I mean, it, it, we're, we're, we're really at the point of how many did they kill, how many did we kill. If that's the attritive logic of violence in the 21st century, what Cobb had to say about that in the charnel house of the Western Front of World War I applies in every sense. You know, he, he said uh, in, in his own writings uh, after the war, and, and I never forgot this when I read it, I thought it was, it was so self-aware. He said that he was proud of having gone through it. He was proud of his physical stamina. But he was ashamed for having been so used and so manipulated by the, the jingoistic creed. And, of course, if you've read anything about how World War I was initiated and, over, you know, and, why, and, 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 and why it was sustained for five years, I mean, never have so many human beings given their lives for so little. And you have to wonder why this lesson of, of this horror show somehow didn't make it to our time as being a meaningful lesson about the nature of war and the nature of, of, of modern warfare. And, and the answer, I think, is in the Second World War, which uh, had a completely different dynamic and taught us other lessons, e- equally meaningful lessons about appeasement and, and totalitarianism and, you know, there should be no more Munichs. Those are the lessons we carried forward into the second half of the 20th century, in some ways to our peril. 
maybe not that we carried that, that lesson forward, but that we carried it forward with it without, the, without the concurrent lesson of World War I. Because uh, World War I now speaks to us, in, in, I think, in some very basic ways and, and has some necessary lessons. And, and Cobb's book, I think, is an entry point for those lessons. I think, you know, in, in a way that other sentimental treatments of World War I pull their punches, he does not. And I think he can speak to that because I think both things have to be learned. It's not enough to talk about standing up to totalitarian and, and, and Hitler wouldn't have been Hitler if we hadn't have done this and, and all valuable lessons and all very true. And yet uh, the lessons that Barbara Tuckman wrote about years ago in The Guns of August are still there and still apparent in terms of wars of, wars of choice, wars of necessity versus wars of choice. World War I was a war of choice. It was a war of vanity and rampant nationalism. And, uh, and Cobb is the victim of that, he was clear-eyed. He saw what had been done to him and to his generation, and he spoke to it uh, definitively, I think. Well, thank you, David Simon, for being our guest on Penguin Classics On Air. Thank you. Thanks for letting me do this. Thank you for listening to Penguin Classics On Air. All the books mentioned on the show are available wherever books are sold. Visit us again for more programs on great classic books.